with what we now know about uh, the diversity of land biomes and water biomes, we can now come back and look at this issue of biodiversity. Uh, in creating an earth that's spherical, God created a variety of climates which allowed him to increase the number of different kinds of organisms that he could create because he could put a different set of organisms in each biome. By actually not only having a land, a set of land biomes, but also water biomes, he can sort of double the diversity there by now having uh, a land biomes and water biomes. And by creating multiple continents, he can further multiply the diversity of life because when you have uh, two different continents that, let's say, are in the, uh, the tropical zones, such as South America and, and Africa, you, you have the possibility of being able to put a different set of organisms in the tropical zone of South America as you do into the tropical zone of Africa. An example here, shown here, is uh, are a couple of organisms put into the grassland zones of North America and Africa. We have the North American prairie dog and the African meerkat. Uh, they're different organisms, very quite unrelated organisms. They look very similar. They dig very similar uh, holes in the ground. They have very similar behavior. Uh, he, God can create different organisms on different continents fulfilling similar functions. Just by creating multiple continents, he can further multiply the diversity of life. Here's an example of a set of anteaters on different continents. We have the ant-eating armadillo in North America, the pangolin in Asia, the South American anteater and the spiny anteater of Australia. Each one of them has similar designs. God created them to eat ants, but they're eating ants on different continents. Each one of them has a narrow, long nose with a very long tongue. They can reach in and grab ants in the process. They each have extremely strong uh, digging claws in their, uh, usually in their front legs, uh, and they've got armor to protect them. I guess the reason for this is if you're an anteater, you're spending an awful lot of time looking down, eating ants, and don't see things come up behind you that are going to attack you. So these organisms are protected from attack in that fashion. I suppose another aspect of it is if you eat ants all your life, you're probably going to be very healthy, and other organisms are going to want to uh, eat your meat. Uh, another example of this uh, similar organisms on different continents comes in the comparison of uh, marsupials and placentals. Marsupials in Australia in particular with the placental mammals that are found elsewhere in the world. Uh, there's some really spectacular similarities between them. Uh, marsupials are like placentals in many ways, except marsupials of course have that pouch uh, that, it, that allows them to raise their young for the last part of the uh, period that would otherwise be inside the body, in the outside of the body, in the pouch. Uh, so in Australia we have marsupial flying squirrels and in North America we have placental flying squirrels. Extremely similar in their behavior, uh, in their design, but they're in completely different groups and they are completely different organisms. God can create a different set of organisms in Australia and North America doing exactly the same thing. There's really some quite amazing similarities between them. We have no longer extant in Australia, but not too long ago extinct, was a tiger, a marsupial tiger that corresponds with the, uh, the, the placental tiger. Uh, there are, uh, there's a marsupial mole that looks almost identical to the moles of, for example, North America. Uh, there's, uh, there's a marsupial wombat that looks very much like the placental uh, ground squirrel and so on. Some pretty amazing similarities between them. This allows God, however, by creating multiple continents to increase the number of different organisms that he created. In addition, in, within a given environment, God has created a variety of organisms by dividing the work that's necessary to be done. Uh, you, for example, 
by creating some organisms that are producers to produce food, other organisms that are consumers, and a third set of organisms that are decomposers, you automatically divide the labor or the work and at the same time increase the number of organisms that you can uh, create in an ecosystem. In, a, in addition to that, he created uh, tiers of organization in many of the ecosystems. For example, in forests, very often there are trees of different sizes or heights. Some trees are designed to not grow above 10, 15 feet. Other trees grow up to about 30, 35 feet, but no taller. Other trees go up to 65 feet and beyond. And when you have all of those things, and then also you got bushes that are shorter than that, and then even herbaceous plants, soft plants that are even shorter than that, that allows you in one forest to put not just one height tree in, but in fact, one, two, three, four, five, five different heights trees. So you can triple, quadruple, even quintuple the uh, number of uh, organisms you can create in a community. And with each one of those different plants, you can put a different animal in each different plant, thus increasing the number of animals. You can also resource, uh, you can al also partition your resources. So for example, uh, there's some plants that would have very large seeds, other plants have small seeds. This allows for the creation of animals that eat only large seeds and animals that eat small seeds. You can increase the number of different kinds of organisms if you partition the resources in a, in a system. And then finally, God can even increase the number of organisms even more by having different organisms come out at different times of the day. You can have one set of organisms, that one set of animals, for example, that uh, comes out at, in the daytime, another that comes out at night, another set that only comes out in the evening and the morning when the day is transitioning into the, into the night or the night transitioning into the day. This allows for three times as many organisms as you would otherwise have. Even the plants have this. If you look at the plants that uh, come up as annuals, come up as uh, soft plants, not with woody structures, and watch this during the year, you'll find that there are some plants that come up and bloom in early spring. There's another set of plants that come up and bloom in the late spring, another set in the summer, another set in the early fall, another set in the late fall. The same ground can actually yield uh, several different species of plants at different times of the year. In this way, God can further increase the number of organisms he's, he creates. The sum of all of this, the result of all of this, is that there's a tremendous biodiversity on the planet. There's a tremendous number of different kinds of organisms on the planet. We have named about 1.8 million different species to date. That is not all the organisms of the planet. We estimate, we don't know how many because we haven't named them all, uh, we g we're guessing maybe 10 million species all total when we finally get done with the count. Uh, so there's a lot of organisms on this planet, an amazing biodiversity. It's a consequence of the very special way in which God created things to, to put so many organisms on the planet. In fact, the number of organisms is a greater number than needs to be there, than has to be there. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I would suggest, an important point. Uh, there's a certain number of organisms you probably need to have to make sure you have enough to survive long term. But actually the number of different kinds of organisms on the planet are, is many times greater than needs to be, which suggests that something has put them onto the planet in that very high diversity to make a point. The evidence that there are more organisms than need to be comes in at least two different, uh, from two different directions. One is the fact that in different groups of organisms, as we classify organisms according to their similarities, some groups have only a single species in them, other groups have as many as tens of thousands of species in them. In fact, some species that are very similar 
to uh, some groups that are very similar to other groups have very, very different numbers of species within each group. That suggests that you don't have to have a thousand species in a group. You could actually get along with just one or just a few. How many different butterflies do you really need in the world? There don't have to be as many as there are. And in, you can see that in some groups of butterflies where there's only a single species, they seem to be getting along quite well. A second evidence that there are more species than there needs to be is the issue of extinction. As far as we can tell, organisms are going out of existence all the time. Organisms that were, uh, that, that were common, let's say, 100 years ago, a number of those species are now gone. How many species are going extinct each year is not really known. People debate about this, partly because we don't even know how many species there are on the planet. But uh, estimates run, you know, 1, 10, 15, 20 species are going extinct every year. And that's been going on for some time. Yet, as species go extinct, it doesn't look like that's causing the whole Earth's ecosystem to fall apart. It isn't like there's, there's, a, there's a special number of species that have to be there or life can't exist, and we happen to be right at that number, because if that was the case, then the extinction of one species would cause the catastrophic extinction of many others. It doesn't appear as if the species that are going extinct are causing a real problem for life on Earth, which suggests there are many times more species than there needs to be. Another topic that we could discuss is the issue of disparity. I have just discussed diversity. Diversity is a measure of how many different species there are. Diversity is a count. Disparity is a measure of how different things are. To distinguish the two, give you a, a kind of a mind, a mind thought here. Think about this. You've got two rooms. One room has a human and a fly in it. Just two organisms in it. That's it. Just a human and a fly. The other room has, let's say, 100 flies. In the room with 100 flies, there are 100 organisms in that room. The diversity of things in that room is 100. In the room with two organisms, a fly and a human, the diversity is only two. The disparity in the room with two organisms is very high because the difference between a fly and a human is very big. It's got much less diversity than the other room. The other room has a diversity of 100. This has only got a diversity of two. But it's got a disparity that is much, much greater because the difference between a human and a fly is a whole lot more than the differences among all of the flies. Disparity is a measure of how different two things are. The disparity uh, found in an ecosystem when you compare bacteria with trees, with uh, woodpeckers, uh, with worms. There's a big difference in those organisms. That is disparity. When we examine disparity, especially in the fossil record, we run into a problem for the naturalists. Because according to naturalism, the diversity of life, the di many different organisms of life, come to be by evolution. Evolution does what it does by branching, uh, by creating new organisms one at a time, making small uh, changes each time as we go along. So in evolutionary theory, you start with a, a basal single species. The species differentiates into multiple species. As time goes on, you increase the number of species. In order to get big disparity, which means to get far away from the original species, you would have to have a whole bunch of branching events, a whole bunch of evolutionary speciation events, to finally get out to a very different organism. In the process, 
while you're getting to a really different organism, to a disparate organism, you're going to have to branch a whole bunch of times, creating a whole bunch of species along the way. So you would expect that you would have to increase the number of species, your diversity, long before you can get finally get to your great disparity. Evolution, if it is true, would predict that disparity will only come in after you have already produced a bunch of diversity. In other words, as you look at the fossil record and look at the lower levels and then work up, it should be that diversity increases long before you get your disparity. But unfortunately for naturalism, that is not what you actually see. In the fossil record, we find disparity before diversity. When we find the first organisms in the fossil record, we find the first animals in the fossil record, we find a bunch of different phyla or major groups of uh, animals very different groups of animals, and not very many of them. Now, the diversity is relatively low. There's no increase in diversity to lead to that point, but there's a very large disparity. That is not what naturalism predicts. That's not what evolutionary theory would expect. Uh, it's more like what you might expect from a god creating great disparity. Poof! He doesn't have to increase the number of species before he creates the disparity, he can actually create the disparity first. Another challenge for uh, evolutionary theory is explaining how you can get organisms to change so much in the relatively short time it has been, uh, has been available for evolution to occur. Now it might be that you think, well, pff, they got billions of years, right? I mean, they got a lot of time. Well. Think about this, the fossil record of horses is such that uh, we, if the time scale that they uh, argue for is correct, and if the fossils really do represent organisms that really do exist, really did exist, then we have horses evolving in the fossil record for 50 million years. Now they start out horses, but they start out horses with fairly different looking horses than we have today. They're short little things, only about three feet tall. They have multiple toes, not a single toe. They have low crown teeth, not the hypsodont teeth that they have today. And they're not able to run the way horses run today. They chew on leaves of broadleaf plants, not on grass. So there's several things that are different, but they look like small horses. In the course of 50 million years of evolution, supposedly, they changed into the horses that we have today. If it took them 50 million years to change from a small horse to a large horse, 50 million years, but the fossil record of all the animals is only 500 million, it's only 10 times that much. If it took 50 million years to produce big horses from small horses, how could you produce how could you go from bacteria to horses in just 490, 450 million years, in only nine times the time? It seems that the amount of change that has occurred in horses does not allow, even if there was a way to explain that, that that does not allow you to create the incredible disparity of life in just 450 million years. So evolutionary theory has a very hard time explaining the origin of disparity. In addition, we have uh, similar organisms on different continents. I've already referred to the prairie dogs and the meerkats on two different continents. They are different organisms, but they look extremely similar. If evolutionary theory is true, then meerkats evolved in Africa and uh, uh, prairie dogs have evolved in North America, and they just happened to come out looking ex very much alike, having similar behavior, digging holes in very similar ways, having a very similar sound, warning sound for organisms that are coming by. This seems extremely, extremely improbable. It's more reasonable to explain that the great disparity we see on the earth was created by a god of diversity, a, a triune God, than it is to argue that they, that disparity came about by evolution. 
there isn't enough time available, even in evolutionary time, to produce the incredible, incredible disparity we have today, it's easier explained by a god having created it in place. And then the fact that we have similar organisms on different continents would suggest that a, that a creator god used the same pattern on multiple continents. That is much better explained by such a god as that than by evolution. All these things are readily explained by God illustrating his triune nature in the world and not according to a naturalistic evolutionary perspective.